Ryan Tannehill in his last four games. He joins Russell Wilson as the only quarterbacks in the Super Bowl era to have a passer rating of 130 or higher in four straight games. I learned this from reading Peter King's column today. Football morning in America. Peter joins us now. Who is this Ryan Tannehill guy, Peter? Oh, I don't know. He's some stranger who uh, uh, I don't think the uh, the good people of South Florida can recognize. <laughs> it's it just, look, he, he, you know, I do think that uh, when he was in Miami, um, you know, he was he was hurt all the time. And, you know, that obviously affected Adam Gase's, uh, you know, tenure there. But uh, I think that when you have a running back who's as hot as as Derrick Henry and you have uh, a team that basically is, is trying to win the ball, win football games, you know, in a very, very old-fashioned way, which is the way they're trying to win it. Um, I, I think that's an advantage to a quarterback who's kind of, and I don't want to say game manager because he's made some great, great throws. Um, but I think it's an advantage to him because all they're trying to do, he, Mike Rabel wants to possess the ball. He wants to be conservative. He wants to, um, he wants to be a team like the Giants of the, night, of the, of the 80s. And um, so I think it's it, it, I think it's a favorable position for a quarterback to be in. Uh, I, I know the Patriots still leading their division. They'll win their division, it, it appears. But how much concern would you have once the playoffs start with New England? Oh, massive. Um, they can't do anything on offense that they really want to do. Um, you know, Brady's getting beat up. He he. You know, it, what's really interesting when you watch these games, especially the national games, when they have so many cameras and they show the full field view and you look and you see how many guys like, you know, there aren't people open, I guess. I mean, I know that it's it's kind of open season on Brady and I get it, but um, I don't really know what else he can do. And that plus the fact that, you know their running game is averaging a yard less per carry than it than it ran for a year ago. So I don't know. I look at all this, Dan, and I I just sort of say that um, you know. And I wrote this morning that I really think. And Romo talked about it yesterday. You know about the gadgets. They've got to they've got to run five or six of those every game because I really think that. There's no other way that they can um, that they can win games now other than by trying to fool teams because you, they can't play teams straight ahead and uh, and either overpower them or you know somebody's open on every snap. Help me understand what Sean McVay is doing now with Todd Gurley because he now sort of has the light go on this epiphany that maybe I need to give him the ball more and more touches here. I, I thought that this was by design that they were going to try to get through the first half of the season, not relying on him too much. And now all of a sudden he decides to go to him. So what, what am I missing here that Sean McVay all of a sudden brought this to light? Well, I continue to think that one of the reasons why um, that he wasn't touching the ball very much is that his knee was not in great shape. And, um, I'm not sure that it still is, but, uh, you know, he wants the ball. They want to give it to him. You know, who knows? I think we'll look back. We'll know the answer to this in three or four years. I don't know that we're going to know it right now. Mm. Um, because I think if you're a coach and you're trying to protect a player who's not totally healthy, I think you, um, you, you, you you never you never talk about what his injury is or you you know or you steer clear of being very specific about that and so we'll see but I, it's hard for me to believe that a guy who was as good as he was um you know 13 months ago uh, that they purposely would not be giving him the ball very much and 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 look 
last night and I think the last couple of weeks, one of the reasons why I think that they're better is that they're a little bit more balanced and they're not putting the ball, uh, they're not putting every game on golf shoulder. And, um, you know, I think, I think it shows what's happening the last few weeks that they're a little bit better when they're better balanced. Talking to Peter King, Football Morning in America. It's available every Monday exclusively on NBCSports.com. If it can go wrong, it has gone wrong for the Browns. Even in victory, they sound like they've been defeated. Uh, how does this end here, Pete, in Cleveland? You know, I think it, I think everybody has an educated guess about it. I mean, one of the things about the Browns is that they don't really leak very much. Um, John Dorsey is... Uh, uh, who, you know, he and Jimmy Haslam are going to make these decisions at the end of the year. Just from watching the way we've all watched, Dan, I mean, they've been, uh, they've been overall now, they've been a sloppy team. They've been a team that uh, always has a fire drill going on about something. They've, and, and so to me, I look at it, it and and I really think they're going to change coaches at the end of the year. Um, and you know the other the other problem I think there is that it's all well and good to um, you know to make a trade. Let's use the Odell Beckham Jr. thing for for uh, you know for an example. It's all well and good to make a trade for a great football player, but I do think that if you do make a trade for Odell Beckham Jr., you have to understand exactly what you're getting. And I think the Browns didn't really understand exactly what they were getting in Odell Beckham Jr. They just thought he was a great football player. He's a major diva, and he requires an incredible amount of, uh, you know, of care and feeding. And most coaches and most teams do not want to deal with that. And I really question, I respect Jay Glazer's ability a lot yesterday, and I believe exactly what he said, that that Odell is telling people, get me out of here, come and get me. Well, it's a little bit different now, isn't it, than it was a year ago when it was just one time. Okay, so now it's the Giants this year who wronged him, and now it's the Browns. Uh, again, in the span of, of a year who, uh, who aren't doing him right. And are they really going to be able to get value for him of any sort? I'd be a little bit surprised, quite honestly, if they got anywhere near the value that they think he's worth. If the Browns' job is open and Dallas is open, which one do you think would be more desirable? It's a really, really good question. Um, I, I, I mean, I think they're, I think they're very, very close. Just because I think the Browns have an awful lot of uh, uh, Browns have an awful lot of good players, and they also have an awful lot of cap room. The Cowboys are going to be really, really cap strapped. I would not want to go to a team that's going to be cap strapped. They're going to have to pay their quarterback. They're going to be in cap trouble for the next few years. I'd probably rather go to Cleveland, um, and that doesn't—that isn't really because I don't think that I'd want to work for Jerry Jones. It's because I've—I've I've seen how they work, and he's not an impossible guy to work for. But I just think over the next few years, it's going to be easier to build and to supplement in Cleveland than it is in Dallas. I mentioned this to the Danettes a little while ago. There's one quarterback who fascinates me every week because he giveth and he taketh away. James, James Winston. And I don't know if Bruce Arians knows what he has. I, 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 I think he likes him an awful lot, but I, I don't know if he's done enough where you keep him or you move on in Tampa. What would you do? I agree. I mean, I, I think you've... Here, here's the problem that I see. If... You do not keep Jameis Winston and you throw him back into the pool. Um, you've won a little bit too much, uh, in my opinion, anyway, as you sort of look at the draft. Now, who knows what's going to happen, but let's say the Bucks end up winning six or seven games. 
Well, you're certainly not getting Joe Burrow. You're probably not getting Tua. Um, and and who knows? I mean, there's a bunch of quarterbacks this year and, and all that. But I, I happen to think that, you know, Dirk Cutter fell on his sword for, for Jameis Winston for a long time. And everybody thought, well, there's going to be tough love now with Arians. Um, but the fact is, Jameis Winston, uh, you know, continues to play like this. And again, agreed with, with, with Arians. Not every interception is his fault. Absolutely. You know, he's had a bunch of tip balls, some fluky things, but he still throws too many. He takes some risks that you shouldn't take. So the big question now is, should you give him a bridge contract and have him for another year or two and basically say, we're just not positive. We can't give you $28, $30 million a year, but we'd be willing to give you $55 million for two years or whatever the, whatever the contract is. That's probably a little bit too much. But we'll give you, we'll, we'll pay you a representative sum over the next two years, and then let's make a decision sometime in the next two years about whether you're going to stay or go. So that's the tough call that they have. The other alternative, I think, just I think, is that, uh, it, you know, there's a couple of quarterbacks, most notably Teddy Bridgewater. What are they going to do this year? For a while, we thought maybe Chicago, maybe Denver uh, would be a good market. Uh, there'd be a market for Teddy Bridgewater. Well, based on the last two weeks, I don't think either one of those teams is going to be spending major on quarterback and disrupting the apple cart that they already have. So, it, you know, I don't think you're absolutely totally stuck with Jameis Winston, but I do think that there's – Absolutely no way I'd commit to him for another four or five years. The only way I'd do it is on sort of a bridge contract where we say, okay, you're our guy for 2020, and then let's make a final decision after that. Pete, good to talk to you. Enjoyed the column as always. It's a Football Morning in America every Monday exclusively on NBCSports.com. Thank you, Pete. Hey, thanks so many, and Dan, have a great week. All righty. For more Dan Patrick Show, tune in to Audience Channel 239 on DirecTV, stream for free on BR Live, or download the Dan Patrick Show app.